If you built your gaming PC fairly recently, you probably own or intend to own a CPU with at least four cores, ideally six, or more if you're fancy, and rightly so, this is just how it is in the 2020s. You can't even pick up a chip with less than four cores without buying into an older platform, and even then, they're not particularly good value. However, I suppose there's a chance you might find yourself in possession of a dual-core CPU in 2025, or are just morbidly curious. Just what is it like to game with one these days? The AMD Athlon brand is like Intel's Pentium in that it was once a signifier of a premium quality product at the top end of the market, but which these days is slapped onto the lowest end, cheapest chips they sell, just to try and lend them some unearned credibility. The desktop ones aren't available for AM5, and even the AM4 models haven't been updated for the newer architectures. The Athlon 3000G had its moment in the sun a few years ago, when it was about the only CPU you could buy for $50, and had integrated graphics that could beat a lot of popular display adapters like the GT710 and 730. Those saving graces in 2020 are not enough in 2025. Games need more threads now. The Vega 3 graphics aren't getting the latest drivers anymore. And for some reason, these things still cost about as much as a Ryzen 7 1700X on AliExpress, which, despite the model number, is still the same architecture as the 3000G. Hell, you could probably find a 3400G for similar money on eBay if you absolutely had to have an iGPU. I figure there'll be two kinds of people watching a video about the Athlon 3000G in 2025. Either people who already own or are thinking of buying one and want to know what to expect, or people who are curious about how such a patently obsolete bit of silicon can handle games that give modern CPUs a hard time. I'll admit my benchmarks are set up for the latter, but I don't want to be too cruel, so I've given the 3000G every bit of help that I can. The cores are overclocked to 4GHz, and I've paired it with some exceptionally good T-Force Dark 3600CL14 RAM that the Athlon's memory controller can't handle, so it's running at 3200CL14 instead. I'm pairing it with my Radeon RX 7900 XT, which should do better than any of my GeForce cards, which would have trouble with the slow CPU because of driver overhead. Before I get to the games, I've decided to forego the productivity test this time round. The aforementioned Ryzen CPUs for the same socket and around the same price are no-brainers when it comes to serious workloads. To illustrate this, the Cinebench 24 multi-core test took over half an hour to finish a single pass with a score of 152. A Ryzen 7 1700X at a slightly lower clock speed scored about four times higher. Civ 6 is practically a synthetic CPU benchmark, at least as far as the AI turn time test. The best of three runs saw an average of 9.49 seconds, putting it just a smidge slower than a Haswell i3 and a fair bit faster than a Sandy Bridge i3. Not exactly auspicious company. The GPU test hasn't been part of my test suite before this month, and frankly, I'm not sure there's much point in it, but I did test the AM4 Ryzen's in this benchmark, so I have some reasonably relevant data for comparison. The roughly 60fps average is about half that of the Ryzen 7 1700X, which core for core is pretty decent performance, but I'll remind you, by current pricing on AliExpress, they're about the same price. Now, I know what you're thinking. Iceberg said he wasn't going to be cruel. Well, Cyberpunk 2077 launched only one year after this CPU, so it's a perfectly cromulent choice of benchmark in my book. At 1080p Ultra, this is still a GPU-heavy title, so I tend to apply a glaucoma-inducing amount of FSR, but honestly, I needn't have bothered. The Athlon averages 50fps, about half the speed of an 8-core of the same generation. Enabling Ultra RT continues the trend, but that means the average is now down to 33 FPS. 
In Hitman World of Assassination, the 3000G really shits the bed. The poor little dual core doesn't have so much trouble with the breaking glass or the crumbling statues, but it simply can't handle all the flying pages once bullets start flying in the library. The 19 FPS average is less than a quarter that of the 1700X without ray tracing, and the RT test sees it drop to 13 FPS, just one fifth of the 1700X. Normal order is restored in Spider-Man Remastered. Yes, I know Spider-Man 2's out for PC now. I'm waiting a while so they have time to fix it before I buy myself a copy. The first game's pretty demanding on CPUs too, and once more the Athlon is about half the performance of a 1700X, averaging 47 FPS to the Ryzen's 97. Enabling RT sees the average fall to a cinematic 24, and 1% lows drop like Gwen Stacy. The rest of the tests are all pretty much worst case scenarios for the 3000G. The Last of Us comes in at just 32 FPS and is a far from smooth experience. Perhaps locking at 30 would go some way to mitigating that, but I don't think it's going to be completely fixable. Also, the first test run had some interesting quirks, but after a restart, everything went back to normal. The City of Baldur's Gate in BG3 is a real workout for any CPU, and the Athlon just doesn't have what it takes, even with the fast RAM and the overclock. I know it's a turn-based game and a low frame rate shouldn't make it unplayable, but you're still not going to enjoy this 20fps average and horrible frame pacing. Starfield didn't seem too bad. OK, it's below what most enthusiasts would consider a playable frame rate, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but it's actually worse than it looks. I tried three test runs in the same area, so there was plenty of opportunity for data to be cached, but regardless, the game paused for several seconds in the same place every time, and in general the stutters were pretty hard to bear. I use a controller for my benchmarks so you guys get a nice smooth video to watch, but mouse and keyboard players will hate this. Space Marine 2 is the first game that actually starts to have consistent visual problems because of the CPU. It seems that when the performance is this poor, the game just gives up trying to animate stuff. At 25 FPS on average, it's not impossible to play, but I found parrying enemy attacks difficult and this game's usually quite forgiving in that regard. Dragon Age Veilguard vale is usually more interesting to test for RT performance, as it becomes a lot more demanding on CPUs. The 3000G can't even load the game with RT enabled, and without RT, the 34fps average is almost 50 frames lower than the Ryzen 1700X. Frame pacing is also pretty terrible, so I'd expect this to be a pretty rough gaming experience. Finally, this is not quite the worst CS2 performance I've ever seen, but it's close. The average across a deathmatch in Dust 2 reached 50 FPS. All bar one of the mini PCs I've ever tested could manage at least 60 FPS, with the one exception being one that was thermal throttling, and some of them do quite a bit better than this. A full fat Ryzen should have no problem averaging 120 FPS or higher, so anyone remotely serious about CS2 shouldn't touch this Athlon with a barge pole. Also, recently I've seen some people mention the possibility that the power monitor in Reva Tuner might be causing a loss in performance, and I might have to look into that in more detail in the future. However, I was curious, so I did a second run in CS2 with the power monitoring on both the CPU and GPU disabled and performance was slightly improved, but generally within margin of error, even down to the 0.1% lows. As I said earlier, the iGPU on the Athlon lacks driver support and isn't really up to the task of modern gaming, but I figured it wasn't completely useless. I happened to have a couple of older games installed, so I gave them a whirl with the graphics card removed. Again, I wanted to give the iGPU an overclock to give it a fighting chance, and after watching an RG in HD video about the Athlon, I copied his settings, bringing it up to 1650MHz. 
Red Dead Redemption released on PC just last year, but it's not a remaster. This is the 2010 original with a couple of higher quality assets at the max settings, and this iGPU probably won't ever see them. The average at 1080p low is just under 40 FPS, and lows drop below 20. My motherboard's HDMI port didn't want to work, so the footage you're watching was captured from a run with the 7900 XT. The game has a 144 FPS cap, and as you can see, the CPU is still holding it back, averaging 114 with terrible 1% lows. I also had Doom 2016 installed. I'd intended to feature it in last week's video, but it turned out the Ryzen 1700X had no issue reaching the 200 FPS limit. The Athlon does have a problem reaching that cap, with the graphics card installed, only managing 157 FPS with lows under 100. But the iGPU won't experience that problem. At 1080p low, with 75% resolution scaling, it can only reach 36 FPS with lows of 30. I admit, I've been pretty harsh on the Athlon 3000G, because I'm a consumer advocate and I don't think you should waste your money on things that aren't good enough. That being said, there's one bit of context I should throw in. My character assassination of the 3000G is based on the going rate of £35 to £40, pounds, which is the price on AliExpress and seems to be about what I'm seeing on eBay. That is an outrageous price. You can definitely get a better CPU for your money, be it a 1700X, a 3200G or 3400G, maybe a 3500 or 3600 if you're lucky. However, I didn't pay anywhere near that for mine. CEX, a used components retailer in the UK who has branches in Europe, sell these for £12 plus postage. I think I paid a little more than that when I bought mine in a shop last year, but it was still far less than the current selling price online. At that price, the competition is much less aggressive. From the same retailer, you can get a Ryzen 1200 for £12, which is only going to be a small improvement over the Athlon when paired with a graphics card and doesn't have an iGPU at all. You can get a 1400 or 2200G for only slightly more money, so I still can't recommend buying an Athlon if those options are available to you. But they do make for slightly more realistic competition than an 8 core Ryzen 7. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.